Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a bi-weekly interview program featuring the lives of immigrants, descendants of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion, created by Think Tank Hawaii and Kingsfield Law Office. We invite renowned immigrants and uh, second, third generation immigrants to share their life stories, journey to the United States, and their contribution to cultural diversity. Today's guest is Evan Kao. Evan is a Minnesota-born writer, comedian, entrepreneurial, and a social media influencer who currently resides in Minneapolis. He earned a bachelor's degree in Japanese studies from the University of Minnesota. He's passionate about martial arts and currently holds the rank of third degree black belt in Taekwondo and the fourth dan in Kundo. He's also a mixed media artist and author of Uber, My Life as a Ride Shear Driver, Uber 2, Wolf in the Jungle and the Wolf at the Gate. We're very pleased to have you here, Evan. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here as well. Well, you are hard to define. I would say you have, uh, you are uh, a novel novelist to me, a writer. You're also a influencer. Now we have a fancier name called a uh, creator. So you are, you have, you know, quarter million followers on social media. And also you are entrepreneur. You're owner of St. Louis Park Gold and Silver store. So you basically is a, a dealer, art dealer. So, but it is my understanding that we cannot label any talented people. So you are talented, you, are, you have multiple identity, and uh, there are so, much, so many questions I want to ask you. I have your books. I really appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the, the gesture you, sh uh, you show to me, and uh, I love the books. I'm uh, eager to read them all. But uh, for, let's start with your name, Carol. Is that a British or a German name? Uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, to be honest, I have a very convoluted family story. My dad actually is one of the first test tube babies made. Uh, he was born in 1952. He uh, did not know his actual biological parents, and he actually found this out through, I think, like Ancestry.com pretty recently. So... The history of my dad, of where the origin of my dad's side comes from, is actually still, there's a lot of mystery. Uh, we just know somewhere in Eastern Europe. My mom's side are Italian uh, and Polish oh. immigrants. So oh. my family my family came to this country around the turn of the last century. My He's not my biological grandfather, um, but he was living in Russia, my great-grandfather. And as the story goes, he uh, escaped Russia. He, he killed two Russian authorities with a lead pipe. And he got his family on a boat, like getting them out of there. And they came to America, like I said, about about 1900 and um, flourished here in St. Paul. Well, that was still the empire of Russia. So what he was escaping the Russia Tsar or escaping the uh, revolutionaries? Uh, I would think the Tsar. Uh, so are. just because it predates the revolution by about two decades. Uh, but, you know, like I said, there's there's still a lot of mystery with my family. Um so should we say you are third generation immigrants? The I think that Russia? I think that would be fair. Yes. Yeah. So because your grandpa would be the first generation, your the mom second, your third generation. Well, do you? How does this family history influence your own life and your um, your life paths? Well, I was raised Jewish. My dad's side was Jewish. When my mom met my dad, she was raised Catholic, but she converted. And Judaism, it's not just a religion. It's its a cultural identity as well. And although I don't really practice, um, I if I have children, I will raise them Jewish too. It's a lovely tradition. And the Jewish faith is a culture. It shapes your outlook on life. Uh, Jews are about loving life, about positivity, about Hard work, entrepreneurialism. Um, Jews have been persecuted throughout human history. They're probably the most persecuted ethnic group in human history. They're certainly one of them. I mean, it's not to, to make it a competition is is warped. But uh, the Jewish people have undergone quite a lot throughout the throughout the history of humanity, and as a result, we're uh, hardworking people with a positive outlook because we kind of have to be. It's a mean world. Well said. Well said, Evan. Well, you. I, I I think not only Jewish people are hardworking, but they are highly creative. 
and you will have express your creativity through your writing, your comedy, and mixed media art. What drives your passion for those artistic endeavors? And uh, in our view, that Jewish, they are very good doctors, lawyers, you know, uh, and, uh, fi finance people, but you are art, art artistic people. So what to, what make you choose basically create creativity as your career path? Well, ironically, I get my artistic genes from the Goyim side, the non-Jew. It's a Yiddish slang term. It's not offensive. Right. It's it's a, a term that the tribe likes to use, shall we say. My mom was a makeup artist. My mom was a very, very successful makeup artist, and she was a multi-talented creative personality as well. I mean, she was in her day, her heyday in the time before social media. Uh, I have no doubt that had social media been around back in the 80s when her career was taking off, that she would have been an influencer as well. But so she, I get my artistic ability and drive from her. I get my sense of comedy from her. My grandmother as well was uh, a very talented uh, drawer and painter. Um, so just that creativity, that artistic side I get from my mom's side and the entrepreneurialism I get from my dad's side because my dad has been, he's had a legendary career. Uh, he's uh, engaged in a number of entrepreneurial endeavors. He's been very successful. He's been also very unsuccessful in some things that have happened to him in his life. But just my parents are... Uh, fascinating combo they they were frequently written up in the star tribune the local minnesota paper mm -hmm. uh as minnesota socialites as these these personalities that people around town just knew so i get a lot of who i am and my personality and persona from that and also my background i grew up an only child um i spent growing up as a kid we had a cabin and we would spend summers up there and just not having siblings it was we had no internet. We had a very small TV, maybe about yay big, with her yep. VHSs that we'd watch movies on. I figured out how to like jailbreak my Nintendo 64 onto it so I would play that. But otherwise, my summers were about entertaining myself and exploring my mind and my passions and my creativity. And that really fostered a lot of who I became all the time that I spent as myself, all the time I spent by myself as a kid. Finding ways to entertain myself, drawing, coming up with skits, just making jokes to myself and then you know my friend group i was always in in middle and high school i was always the entertaining one i was a class clown but just being an only child you kind of become accustomed to being a center of attention and so like when i go to parties i'm usually the not just because i'm famous now but i'm usually the center of attention because i like to put on a show i like to entertain people i like to make people laugh uh my least favorite kind of personality to encounter in the wild is somebody with shall we say like an engineer's brain where everything is analytical and they can't process a joke or humor because mm -hmm. they want to dissect it and like well wait it's like just laugh my god don't don't think just laugh it's meant to be funny so i'm always kind of like that i'm always in, inserting jokes even if a uh, situation i'm dealing with is heavy or not funny i find a way to make it funny because i've also come to discover that making making humor out of something that is not funny is the best way to own whatever is not funny well, just thank you so much for cheering people up. And uh, only when we realize the ultimate absurdity of life and uh, exactly. we could be able to really laugh. Yeah. Well, I get to know you because you become a very famous people in the Chinese world. And you discovered a photo album depicting World War II, Japanese war crimes in China. And that was a huge event because in 1960, uh, 37 to 45 Chinese uh, fought against Japanese in China and uh, after the Pearl Harbor it became part of the uh, World War II the Allied Forces China partnered with the United States and you discovered this very rare photo album and uh, then you donated it uh, to, the, uh, to China so could you just walk through how you came across this album and what motivated you to finally decide that this belong to China, not in you, not in your store. All right, let me see if I can do this whole story in three minutes or less. I'm right. pretty good. I've got pretty good at telling it. Uh, so I have a Thank program. You. I entered the business that I'm in. I own St. Louis Park Gold and Silver, and I entered it very randomly. Basically, I spent my 20s trying to be a writer, and I failed. And I had a number of different outlooks that I was trying to succeed at. I first tried to break into Hollywood as a screenwriter and a film producer. And I, I mean, I honestly, I got pretty close, but it... Ultimately didn't work out. I pivoted to books. And in the meantime, the jobs that I was working were just low skill, high labor jobs just to, to get a paycheck so that I could devote all my time to my artistic endeavors, writing and creativity and such. And 
it still wasn't working. And so I was about to turn 30 and I thought I need a change. And I randomly got a tip that an elderly person who owned a gold business was looking for an apprentice. And I begged him for a job. And long story short, after working for him for 18 months and creating a successful social media account that was generating a lot of sales, he wanted me to shut the whole thing down because he was old and he didn't understand it, even though it was making him a lot of money. So I ended up going off on my own, opened up my own store. But, you know, opening your own store is hard. I kind of hit the ground running. And I created this program. It started when I was working for this other person. And then I really kind of drove it home. And it's ma uh, mail me stuff. Mail me stuff from anywhere in the United States. I don't buy stuff internationally, but anywhere in the U.S., mail me your stuff. I'll make a video about going through it, and I'll tell people what it's worth. It's like Antiques Roadshow, and then I'll try and sell it for profit. So about a year and a half into, open, into owning my business, somebody reached out to me, and they said, I have a photo album from World War II, and the photos are disturbing. And, you know, I get all kinds of stuff advertised to me. The whole war was disturbing, mm -hmm. so I thought nothing of it. And I said, send it to me, and I get this photo album. And I flip it open, and the first thing that struck me was the quality of the album, not just this is beautifully leather-bound, ordained, like these two dragons looking up. And the photos in it were incredible. They were like National Geographic quality. It's a soldier stationed in Southeast Asia in 1937 is when he arrives. And so I'm going through this book, but a few pages in, it just turns to slaughter. And I see the word Nanking written a bunch. And having majored in Japanese studies, I knew all about the horrors of what happened in Nanking. And I thought, holy crap. This might be photos from the Nanking Massacre. And these photos were, are, if these are real, these are really, really expensive. And I turned this over my head because I wasn't sure what to do. One of my rules is uh, I don't buy stuff affiliated with war crimes. It's got to go to a museum. It's just too historically important. It does not belong in a private collection. It's an ethical concern. And frankly, I just think it's a slant to his. It's, uh, it's not good for history to have things like that in private collections. They need to be studied and preserved and shared with everyone. So I turned this over my head a couple days what to do. And the guy reaches out to me and he's like, you know, hey, I know you got my book. Like, you know, pay me or what? And I find myself in this dilemma. And meanwhile, might be photos of Nanking in my head over a few days turns into, I think these are. And so I made this TikTok because I, this guy wanted an answer. And I thought, well, I just got to scream so loud that people hear me because I have had items that belong in museums advertised to me in the past and every time i reached out to a museum i never even got the time of day and i had a quarter million followers at this point so i thought i just need to make a video that gets attention because that way i can get a museum to take this and what i accidentally did was created a perfect storm of words with a tiktok and the video went immediately mega 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 viral it got like like tens of millions of views. It was shared internationally within 24 hours. And I suddenly found myself the ire of the internet because I made a mistake. Uh, a lot of the photos were what are known as souvenir photos. Uh, these are photos that were taken and sold for profit and they were copies. And sailors would trade these photos. I don't know why they would do this. It's really gross, but they would trade these and fill these books that they would have with these photos. Not all of them were real, only or not all of them were fake. Only maybe about 20% of them were souvenirs. And they're like, the best quality souvenirs out there. Uh, no, obviously, nobody looked at this book. So what had happened was the original soldier took the photos back after the war, and he died in 1964. His name was Leslie G. Allen Jr., and his wife contracted the person that I ended up acquiring the photos from. Uh, his father did a contracting job, and the lady didn't have enough to pay him, so the story goes. And so she gave him this book in lieu of payment. He died. He never looked at it. Son's going through his stuff, finds the book, and that's how it ends up in my hands. Now, I became this global sensation, like, overnight, and I had people accusing me of using a war crime to get famous. Like, I was getting threats. I was getting, I, look, I don't want to get into it, but it got really scary really fast. So I um, got a lawyer, and, you know, the lawyer said, what do you want to do with this? I had Chinese people showing up at my store, hugging me, giving me flowers, crying, writing me letters. It was so in, it just got so insane. It was so much to handle so fast. And I thought, well, I need to donate this book and I need to donate it to China because it's Chinese history. And this book has become a symbol of what happened. So ultimately, I used my lawyer to contact the consulate because I thought, you know, I shouldn't just try to privately call a museum. I should just give it to them and let them figure out where it goes. And I met the uh, Chinese ambassador or one of them. He flipped to Minneapolis with his assistant. Uh, we signed a contract. I donated them the album, and they presented me with a letter of thanks and a porcelain tea jar as a diplomatic gift, which I later found out is like an incredible honor to be uh, bestowed. So that's why the book ended up in China. It I made a mistake. I corrected the mistake, but the book 
This is this is my favorite irony. My name is Pawn Man on the internet. I don't own a pawn shop. It's just a catchy name. One of my followers started calling me Pawn Man when I first started making videos, and I thought that's a great name. And so now I trademarked it and branded it. But Pawn Man that doesn't do pawn has a book of photos about the Nanking massacre that contains actually no photos about Nanking, but it ended up educating the whole world about this genocide because it's not properly taught in the West like it is in the East. And I don't have a good answer for why that is. But because this book educated, this TikTok that I made, educated so many people about this massacre that was buried by the Japanese army, that's still such a painful part of Chinese history, uh, it wanted to say thanks. So now I'm, uh, now I'm a Chinese celebrity. You are. Thank you very much. It's not quite uh, three minutes, but it's very, very good. I saw Chinese matter. Yeah, as a Chinese American and uh, as a lawyer, I want to say first, I want to say thank you, and uh, second, I don't think it was a mistake, and even you can call it an honest mistake. But however, first, that the when you see Nankin Road on the photo. And only a handful of Chinese can understand that that would be a, a road in Shanghai city, not in Nanking city. Second, if even it was not about the Nanking massacre, the rape of Nanking per se, but it is about the Sino-Japanese war. The uh, it was about the time. It's about the Shanghai, Sh the war uh, around Shanghai, and even it was not original copy uh, treated as souvenir, but it's uh, Archit not archi historically is still very valuable and even we can even use that as a window to study why this kind of stuff were treated by Japanese as a souvenir. What that particularly mean? So I really appreciate you donated to the, the authorities so they can probably engage some historians and art historians and hist and World War II historians to study it. So but uh, as you said, you were under tremendous stress because all kinds of unwelcomed, uh, solicited comments and uh, uh, accusation. And uh, how do these all of these ha what happened during this storm? You wrote an article through the storm, and a fantastic article. I have read all of them. And uh, how did this make you to look at the power and um, the of uh, social media, and how does this uh, impact your thinking of the social media? Well, as far as what it did to me, I mean, I wrote about it in the essay. Uh, if you visit my website, uh, uh, pawnmanstore.com, I had to think where it was for a sec. I posted all the photos on my website, as well as this essay that I wrote, detailing all the crazy that I went through, because it is a new facet of our culture, this a uh, video that gets shared across the internet all over the world and gets picked apart a million ways from some Sunday and everybody has an opinion. And to have your actions and words taken out of context and have it completely run away from you in a way that you can't control. And potentially, you know, I'm thinking, I'm sitting here looking at this thinking like, God, did I ruin my life? Did I ruin my reputation forever? I may never be able to fix this. I might be the, the World War II hoax guy. What a horrible thing. They're accusing me of using a war crime to get famous. That's the... Even I want to punch me, you know, hearing that. So to have that on your conscience, have, you know, everybody sees you, everybody knows you for, you know, it's faded now, but definitely I was getting recognized everywhere I went and not like not in a good way. And it was really scary. And it just speaks to the power of how fast things spread on the Internet, how uh, right now somebody could create another perfect storm of words with the right tone, the right words, the right setting, the right backdrop. Uh, anybody can make something like this, and I did it on accident. And, you know, Mr. Beast uh, is a good example, not for the, the same reasons, but that's a guy that is able to make a viral product no matter what. He even sa has said in interviews, there's ways to do it. And when you make something like that, it's a bullhorn heard around the world. Uh, never in a million years did I think this thing was going to spread so fast. Like I said, as far as what it did to me, it absolutely melted my brain. I, I had a couple weeks of, like, just... Men mental duress, the likes of which I've never felt in my life. I developed some substance abuse problems. Um, I lost 20 pounds. I wasn't eating. I was puking. I was having panic attacks. Oof. And I'm still in therapy. I see a therapist now because of this. The last, the damage that this caused me is ongoing. It's getting better, but it's um, it's a lot to deal with. And it, it's, it's a very exclusive club. 
to be the subject of this viral video that's picked apart. And I wouldn't I tell you guys, anybody watching, you don't want to be in this club. It's not fun. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I came to fill in the shoes of something that's new in our culture with technology and sharing information. And them is heavy shoes that make you sink in water. I'll tell you that much. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Evan, what happened. The cyberbullying is a real thing now. And uh, it's just uh, so absurd and uh, it's illogical and it's just uh, very quite hard to to understand. The, and, uh, the, sorry to interrupt, but the internet is not a nice place. And we went in... Oh, with, like a jungle. Uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, as they say. The internet was created for good, or it was thought of as being this good gateway that was going to change the world and make it more fair and just. And instead, all it's done is embellish all the evil and terrible in people. Uh, it's created this culture of never say sorry, of bullying, of attacking, of stupidity. You know, it's ironic that the sharing of information is actually largely made us dumber. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, totally agree. Totally agree. Well, so... Uh... I will not to leave the show without to talk about Japan. You studied uh, Japanese studies at UOM, and uh, by its pure serendipity, I just received in my office a very beautiful greeting card from Tokyo. Oh, that's good. And my my Japanese friend sent me a English uh, language Japanese uh, cookbook, and uh, you might be surprised that as a Chinese and a Chinese American, I I'm pretty fond of Japanese culture. And tell us about why you uh, cho chose uh, Japanese studies as your major in college. Oh, it's a, it's a convoluted answer. Let me see if I can break this one. Oh. Down. I uh, grew up watching Japanese cartoons. Like, I can tell you any episode of anything that happens in Dragon Ball Z. I've seen the whole series. I don't know how many times. Uh, I love Japanese cartoons. And I continue to watch them to this day at age 34. So my love of that, uh, when I was trying to break into Hollywood as a screenwriter, uh, a way, there's no there's no good way to do it. It's one of the hardest things that you can break into. It's a 99.9999% failure rate, anybody trying to do it. You got to have a good plan. And I thought to myself, well, I want to do this. I want to try and break into Hollywood. What's a good plan? And I had the ability to predict box office numbers. I'm not as good at it anymore because I don't keep up with the trends like I used to. But like I used to make spreadsheets on box offices and what movies coming out and what I thought they were going to gross. And I was almost always right. I was really close almost every week. So I thought, you know what the next big trend is going to be? We are in this Marvel trend right now. I started doing this around 2009. Marvel's a big thing. I think that big big budget Hollywood studios are going to turn to Japanese cartoons and try to adapt them. And I want to put myself in a position to be the go-to guy for, hey, who are we going to hire? Let's hire Evan Kale because he speaks Japanese. He knows all about Japanese culture. He grew up on the stuff. He knows he knows Hollywood films. He knows how to write. And he can adapt these for an American audience. So that was, honestly, that was why I picked Japanese studies was I wanted to have that armed with me going into the screenwriting endeavor. Like I said, it didn't work. But uh, my love of Japanese culture and particularly... My love of samurai culture. Um, I studied kumdo, which is Korean sword fighting. But the martial arts and the weapon used, the curved sword, the one bladed, or the sword with one uh, blade's got one side on it. That weapon, uh, it's a little bit of chicken and egg as to who actually invented that, the Japanese or the Koreans. I'll tell you, in my opinion, the Japanese perfected it. But the Koreans were very big on that art, too. I couldn't find anybody to teach me Bushido uh, or, or Kendo or anything. So that's why I took uh, Kumdo, because that was available to me. But uh, my love of samurai culture also was a huge driver, and my love of martial arts uh, as well, uh, as to why I majored in Japanese studies. Now, to be honest, my Japanese is terrible now. I can barely speak it. Um, but the cultural aspect remains. My knowledge of the history remains. And you know, I, I kind of joked because I could not, one of the reasons why I was an Uber driver and I did all these high skill, low labor jobs, not just because I wanted to devote all my, my spare time to creativity. I couldn't get a job to save my life with a degree in Japanese studies from the University of Minnesota. I couldn't even get a warehouse job. And I kept for years thinking to myself, what, a, this was a stupid degree. This, this did nothing for me in life. It, all it did was leave me with that. But ultimately it armed me with the knowledge that kind of accidentally put me right here now talking to you. So no, actually, indeed, it, 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 I did turn out to do something productive with it. Well, thank you very much. It's a good degree. And uh, really pretty. I can tell that uh, walking your store, I saw the Japanese painting and I, I really uh, you know, understand the influence of Japan. And I, personally, I love Japanese culture. 
I'm not a big fan of samurai culture, but uh, Japanese painting, calligraphy, and poetry is fantastic. Well, the samurai culture was ultimately kind of dragged through the mud in World War II because that was the uh, methodology, shall we say, of the soldiers and the war crimes that they committed. But let's uh, let's not get into that. <laughs> well, we normally uh, end our show with two questions to our distinguished guests. The first question is, you are still young. You're much younger than me. But uh, what advice you could offer to a younger self? And if you were in your 20s, you've time travel permits, you can travel back to the early 20s and what advice you want to give to yourself. Second question is, is there any specific book, movie, or cartoon you want to recommend to our audience? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, okay, first off, what, what advice should I give myself? Well, I actually am a big fan of, uh, shall we say, uh, quantum physics and all kinds of you know oh, convoluted physics here. so if you know if there's only one timeline you know it's not multiple universes then by going back and changing things i would change everything and make my life worse because who knows where i'd end up and i wouldn't do anything different because i'm pleased with where i am that said i went through quite a lot of suffering in my 20s my family grew up very wealthy and my family lost everything when i was 18 they hid it from me uh they started going broke when i was 16 i didn't know and they like right as I was packing up going to college, uh, Evan, by the way, not only can we not pay for your college, we can't give you anything. You're going to have to figure it out. And so I was, I lived in squalor uh, for my entire 20s. I was so poor. I didn't have money to buy food sometimes. It was really, really hard on me. So the perseverance that I, I instilled in myself and, you know, my tough attitude, it got me through it. But I would just go back and tell myself it is going to be okay. You just got to keep fighting and keep pushing that boulder up the mountain. Um, I would also give myself the advice of taking advantage of social media a lot earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. I really wish I had gotten on YouTube when I originally wanted to in 2008, 2009. That was, I, I mean, I might be way more famous now, way more successful. But, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not discrediting or discounting where I am now. Uh, I had some reservations about putting myself out there on the internet. I thought, well, what are people going to think of me? And so that prevented me from making videos. I didn't start making content until... 2014 or 15 and my my like first youtube videos are kind of unwatchable uh, they're really bad this pawn man persona ended up being well i failed and how do i make a niche where i can break out because what you need now is you can't just be beautiful you can't just be queer you can't just have one thing that you're going to talk about you got to have something really niche and be really good at it and when i started making content for pawn man i looked out on the landscape of social media and i said my god there's nobody in the space or at least nobody like me with a personality. And that was immediately an advantage to me. So I would have got myself on social media a lot earlier. On um, a second question, what would I recommend for Japanese for cartoons? So my all-time favorite movie, I have two. Uh, live action, all-time favorite movie is Pulp Fiction. But my other all-time favorite movie is Princess Mononoke. I've seen it probably 50 times. I am a huge fan of Hayao Miyazaki. He's a, I'm not going to swear, he's a master of what he does uh the newest movie that just came out by i absolutely loved it the boy and the heron he's he's such a genius with everything he does so any miyazaki movie i'd recommend my all-time favorite anime i have two uh cowboy bebop uh, a lot of people say that that is the you know kind of the go-to everyone's favorite anime it's an excellent cartoon massively impactful on my life the story is excellent the music's great the art is great everything about it it just sings there's a live action adaptation on Netflix that I actually thought they did a good job. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the hardest things with adapting Japanese cartoons, it is really tough to make it live action, to make it engaging and interesting and to have a story that relates, especially to American audiences. And Netflix's product I thought was fabulous and they canceled it after one season because it wasn't getting good ratings or reviews or people weren't watching it. So that's a, I'd recommend you guys check out the first season of it. Um, it really was great. My other favorite, I am a massive fan of Mobile Suit Gundam. It's kind of the Star Wars of Japan, and I've seen all of it. My favorite is Gundam 0083. It's a, thir or it's a 12 episode miniseries. Shinichiro Watanabe, who I think he was the main artist on Cowboy Bebop, he did that one too. He's got a very specific style. He's very, very good at what he does. Um, Gundam 0083, you, you don't need to watch any other Gundam stuff to get into that one. That's my other favorite. What? Cool. So thank you so much for the recommend all the recommendations. Well, thank you, Evan, for the time. Fascinating life story, fascinating comments on social media, and uh, uh, again, thank you so much for sharing the story about the World War II album. 
And I thank you for donating it to Chinese. And finally, thank you for the, all the recommendations. I learned a lot from, from you today. Really appreciate your time. Evan Carl, entrepreneurial, influencer, content creator, comedian, and author. Thank you. Check out my books, everyone. We will. We will. Aloha.